Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's Applying to Creative Courses portfolio session. We've got an absolutely fantastic webinar lined up for you today, designed to give you all of the information you need to create the perfect portfolio to land your dream university place. Now, if you're interested in studying art, design, fashion, animation, architecture, and many other creative courses, you'll need to submit a portfolio as part of your application. So we're joined today by representatives from the University for the Creative Arts who will be delivering a presentation on how you can showcase your talents in your portfolio. So the session is being live streamed on Zoom and YouTube, so if you have any questions, please post them in the YouTube chat or the Zoom Q&A section and representatives from the University for the Creative Arts will be answering all of your questions as we go through the webinar and at the end there will be a Q&A session where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible live. So I'm now going to hand you over to Savannah from the University for the Creative Arts, who's going to talk to you a bit about her university and how you can create the perfect portfolio. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you very much. So hi, everyone, and welcome. Very happy to have you here with us today. Um, we have a wonderful presentation coming up for you all about our top tips for portfolio and how to make your portfolio. Um, as mentioned, I'm from the University for the Creative Arts. We are based across the southeast of England with over 100 different kind of courses, um, creative courses that you can go. And no matter where you're looking for, this talk is going to be really, really useful for all the kind of areas you're looking for at your portfolio. I will be in the back of the scenes answering questions throughout the presentation and then there obviously will be a Q&A at the end for myself and Georgia. So please do feel free to ask us any questions or more than happy to help with anything you'd like to ask us today. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our wonderful Georgia, who's going to be introducing herself and to give you the talk about portfolio advice. Hi everyone, so I'll just quickly introduce myself before we get started. Uh, I'm Georgia, I graduated in 2018 and ever since then I have been freelance. I did a fine art degree and now I work with a few different universities as well as for my own business. So I do review a lot of portfolios. I made one myself, I have one myself for different bits and pieces and I am um, someone who looks a lot at student portfolios as well. So what I'm going to do is start sharing a PowerPoint with you. We're going to take a look at all of the basic bits and pieces that you need to know for developing your own portfolio. And then we are going to answer some questions. So if you do have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll work through them as we go along. We do cover quite a lot in this, so hopefully we'll cover everything you need to know. But in case there are any slightly more specific things, then do feel free to ask those. So I'm going to start sharing my screen with you now. Hopefully you are able to see that nice and easily. And first of all, beginning that portfolio. This is what you want to be doing for your ideal creative job. And what we're going to cover in this PowerPoint, again, like I said, we've got a, quite a few things to go through, so I'm going to start whizzing through. First of all, what is a portfolio exactly? Now, of course, you're going to need to begin to construct your portfolio. It's important to understand what exactly we expect to be in that portfolio as a university. So you're not just going to be using it for university, you are going to be using it for all sorts of things as well in a professional sense. You're also going to need to know what to include. This might seem really, really obvious. It's one of those things that some people say, why are you telling me what to include? Of course I know what to include. But there are lots of things that you might not necessarily think of when you're talking about a portfolio that are really important. And they're going to show off exactly who you are as a creative individual and why a university should choose you over somebody else. We're also going to take a look at how to order it. Again, this might seem like a bit of a weird thing that we're going to be reviewing, but it is something that can really affect how a viewer perceives your portfolio. And dependent on how you make work and the kind of work you make, the way that you build it is going to differ in order to suit your work best. And also getting to know that portfolio. So when someone's looking through your portfolio, whether that is on an online interview, in an in-person interview, they're going to ask questions about everything they're seeing. Anything that you put in that portfolio, you've got to expect a question about it. So you need to know the work that is in there really, really well. And that also helps you to tailor the conversation in a way that you want it to go. So you might want to talk about a specific piece of work that you've got. It's good to be able to know about exactly what you need to put in there, exactly what is in there, so you can kind of push that conversation in the direction to be able to show that particular piece of work. 
So let's get started. What is a portfolio and why is it important to the creative industry? Now, I'm not going to be talking about a specific kind of portfolio today. I know I mentioned that I'm uh, a fine art graduate, but we're not just going to be talking about particular kinds of portfolios. We're going to go over everything. So anything that I mentioned today, you can kind of assume is going to suit the creative portfolio that you're going to be developing. There are a few tweaks and twists that you might want to make dependent on the exact course you're doing, but they're the kind of thing that you'll be able to find out on the university website and any sort of interview instructions you get. So this is a general overview of what a portfolio might be. So. This is an example of a portfolio page. Now, this is one that I found online. This is a Behance one. And this is one that I really, really like. This is a really good example of a development page in a portfolio. We've got some images of creative inspiration. So we've got pictures here that they have sourced that are going to further enhance the ideas that they've got for their piece. They've got a personal design style and aesthetic. So what I mean by that is the bars that they've got down here are consistent throughout the whole portfolio. So they've got a kind of look that goes with their whole piece. So as an interviewer, I can see, ah, this is the kind of aesthetic that they're going to give me with whatever work they're making. So these bars with the small annotations are really, really useful to give a kind of consistent feel throughout the portfolio that you've developed. We've also got those developmental considerations. So we've got some research here, but we've also got development. So we've got some color palettes. And if any of you have had the chance to be in one of my lessons somewhere at some point, I go on about color palette a lot. And it is really important to, again, give a feel for the kind of work you make. If you're someone that only ever does stuff in blacks and golds and whites, it's going to be really different from people who make things in kind of bright neon colors. And your portfolio should be reflecting that as well. And then it's good to have some fully fleshed ideas as well. So it's not all about the development, but similarly, it's not all about those final pieces. We want to see the progression throughout your artistic practice. And in terms, again, of the kind of portfolio that you might like to make, there's a few reasons why you might make a physical versus a digital one or why you might make a physical one and then scan it in so it can be digital as well. If you're going to make a digital portfolio, they really suit things like your animation, games design, things like photography, filmography, uh, anything like that are really good and suit themselves naturally to a digital portfolio. Whereas you might want to consider a physical portfolio. So one of your kind of sketchbooks or the standard black holdy kind of A2, A1 portfolio style. If you're an artist that does things like paintings or a creative that does clothing design, textile design, installation, anything like that. So think of the way that your work is made. If you're someone that makes digital work, if you're doing it on uh, Procreate, InDesign, graphic design, anything like that, probably digital is going to suit you better. Whereas if you're someone that makes physical work, a physical portfolio is always great because it means people get a chance to see your work kind of up close, see the texture, feel the fabrics, anything like that. But like I say, of course, sometimes universities will want you to do an online uh, interview like we're doing now, an online session. And that's something that is very prevalent at the moment. So you might need to digitize a physical portfolio. And of course, that's just a case of taking photos, scanning in, but we will go into that in a little bit more detail in a moment. So when we are looking at that portfolio, there are a few different things that we want to see. We want to get a lot of information from this. And generally, an interview will be kind of 20, 30 minutes. So we don't have a lot of time. But this is the kind of thing that we want to be looking for. So who you are as a creative practitioner, like we say, it, are you a fine artist? Are you an architecture student? Are you going to be a graphic designer? What kind of graphic design are you going to be doing? any work that you have previously undertaken. So we want to see those briefs, which moves us on to the next point. How successfully can you follow a brief? Are you good at that developmental process as well? And are you doing any self-directed projects? That is another really important thing that people often forget about, including self-directed work. Evidence that you're able to contextualize your work and place yourself in a contemporary creative setting. Now that sounds a bit fluffy. It's a really kind of fluffy way of saying, we want to know that you do your research. We don't want to just see that you're making artwork here and there, doing creative things here and there. We want to see that you're researching other creatives. Maybe that's going to a gallery, doing artist research online, exploring documentaries, videos, things like that, that really kind of put your artwork in line with the creatives that are working in your field today as well. 
We also want to see critical technical and theoretical abilities and again kind of a fluffy way of saying we want to be able to see that you can look at your work objectively and go okay so this this thing that I did here wasn't that great so I then decided that I was going to develop on that by adding this and this and this and then I did this and that's way better we want to see that process of you being able to understand what might not be so good about your work and then developing that as well and then, of course, how skilled you are in your chosen media. We want to see the artwork you can make and how good it is and any of the creative things that you're doing and how good they are as well. So this is an example of a portfolio set here, another one that is really hammering home that aesthetic. And again, this is a double page. This is one that has been created digitally, but this is a really, really good example of a portfolio. We've got some aesthetic considerations with these black bars, the crows that are on each page, and then this kind of torn fabric that's at the bottom. We've got some really good contextualization. So we're not just looking at a random selection of images and going, why are these here? I don't understand what's going on. We've got some really good buzzwords. So we've got color palette, and then a little bit of an explanation of that, their inspiration. We've got different images that they've used to develop their own work. And then again, we've got some buzzwords like intelligence, wings, birds, just so that we can get a feel for the project as a whole. This is a really good introduction to a section of a portfolio. So what to include, how to show off the best bits and pieces from your work and your creative talents. Generally speaking, we will include around 16 to 20 pieces of work or pages. So when you're thinking of that kind of standard uh, sort of black portfolio, 20 sort of boards, 16 to 20 boards of work. Alternatively, if you are doing it on something like a website, maybe a PowerPoint for a digital version, having that kind of 16 to 20 slides is probably your best bet. And the reason that this is the case is you probably won't get a chance to look at any more of that in a university interview or even something like a job interview. Uh, if you are buying for a commission, you probably won't be able to show much more than that. And that's because the interviews are quite short. As I say, about 20 to 30 minutes before you get some questions. So you're not going to be able to go through pages and pages and pages. And especially if you want to highlight something that you're really proud of and you want to talk about it a little bit more, you're not going to be able to get through 50 pages of work. And one example that I always like to give is uh, when I was doing my interview many, many years ago, I had one particular piece of work that I was kind of meh about. I wasn't particularly kind of excited about it, but my interviewer was, and he really, really wanted to talk about it. So we spent about 15 minutes of our kind of 25 talking about this one piece of work. So there were so many things that we had to really quickly flip through. And that is again, a reason why we're kind of skimming it down a little bit. And everyone knows the phrase, quality, not quantity. You don't want to shove everything that you've ever made in there. You want to kind of be able to critically sit down and look at your work and think this, this is good. I want to put this in. I want to talk about this. I get excited about this. And then maybe something that you're not such a fan of kind of sweep that out. Oh, I'm a little bit stuck, there we go. Then again, examples of quality research and development. We don't just want to see the final pieces, we want to see how you got there. Generally, when you're marked at university, you're not just gonna be marked on that final outcome, you're going to be marked on your research of different uh, creatives, you're going to be marked on how you use media, how you use techniques, how you use kind of any digital platforms. And that's what we want to see in the portfolio as well. We don't want someone who's just going to make something and then get bored of it and make something else. We want to see how you can progress your work and your creative process. So things like drawings are always good to put in there, initial sketches, whatever you might include, initial drafts. And even if there's things that you might not like, sometimes these are helpful to include as well if you've developed on them. Like I was saying, if you've done something and thought, eh, not for me, don't like how that turned out, but I'm going to try it like this instead, that's always a really good progression to include. And anything that you can't take along with you if you're doing an in-person interview, always take photos of that. If it's too big, if you've got a massive AO canvas and you don't want to traipse that down on the tube or anything like that, take photos of it, but take detailed photos. We want to see the whole thing and then we want to see detail. So for example, if you are doing a textiles course, take a photo of the whole garment, and then take a photo of the individual stitching, some close-ups of the fabric, that kind of thing. So we can really get a feel for exactly what you are doing. 
Um, some of the examples of this, I did just mention a few of them in that little session, but there are some kind of prevalent examples of this that I did want to quickly go through. So things like storyboards, if you're doing games design, animation, graphics, videography, anything like that, storyboards are great. Essays, if you've had to write essays about any particular thing, maybe you had to write an artist's essay, things like that. Animations and digital work, any websites that you've worked on or created are really good. Maquette, so if you have perhaps planned an installation or planned a larger piece and you've made a kind of little model of it, that's good. Trials you don't like but haven't improved on, I've talked about that, but that is a really good one to include. If you've not done anything with it, maybe don't stick it in there. But if you have done something with it and improved it, stick that in. Again, artist research, it's one of those things that you don't really think you're going to be doing that much when you become a creative, but taking a look at other artists' work is really important. You're often going to be working collaboratively when you're in the creative industry, so getting a feel for who works similarly to you is really, really important, and it can really build on your own inspirations as well. Colour palettes, again, colour palettes are a really important one, just to get a feel for your aesthetic and the kind of work you're going to make. Swatches and samples of media, fabric, anything like that. Your first hand research, if you have been, for example, say you're painting flowers for your project and you've gone and taken a million photos of flowers, that's not your final outcome, but that is really good quality first hand research that you've then been developing in your work. Again, photography, sketches, and different use of different media as well. If you have been trying a few different things out, put that in because we do want to see all the different kind of work that you have been developing. And this is an example of that developmental process. So this is by an artist called Matthew Filipowski. And this is a progression of some work that he has made. And these would be really great to include in a portfolio. So over on the left hand side here, we've got a really quick thumbnail sketch. We've just got that kind of brief outline, plotting exactly where everything's going to be, just getting a feel for what the artwork is going to turn out like in the end. Again, doesn't have to be an artwork, it could be a garment, it could be anything to do with a kind of architecture project, it could be something to do with filmography, a little storyboard, anything like that. But it's really good just to have that kind of base level, that sort of practice initial piece. And if you don't want to keep that piece and you're going to work on it, take photos as you go along. That's another really important part of developing a high quality portfolio. You want to have photos of each step of that process. So we move on to this centre image here. We can see that actually some figures have been outlined a little bit. We've not really got too much texture going on, but we can see that actually, okay, we've got some outlines here. There's a little bit of a change from that first piece. We've got some additional figures. We've got some additional props that are coming in. And then moving on to this last section here, we've got some really kind of high quality rendering. So this isn't what it's going to look like in the end. We're just getting a feel for where those light shades need to be, where the dark shades need to be, where that pop of white is going to be to make that centerpiece stand out as well. And then finally, we move on to the painted, finished, rendered image. So we can now see how this has turned into this. And it's a very different piece. There are lots of things that are connecting it, but seeing that process as they go along is really useful to understand how that artist works, which is an important part of showing off the work you make as well. So you want to be including work that has been set to school briefs, college briefs, A level briefs, whatever, whatever you might be at you want to include work from that and you also want to include self-directed work so i'm not saying you've got to go and design a whole piece of branding or make a giant painting for a fine art piece what i mean is any personal sketches you've done if you're someone that uses tiktok if you've made any art videos any tutorial videos something you put on instagram anything like that is all really good stuff stuff <laughs> to show there because it's showing that you're not just doing the things that you have to do to scrape by you are making that creative project your life you're making it kind of dedicated and you're showing initiative that you're going above and beyond what you absolutely have to do to continue learning about and progressing your creative practice and Again, similarly to that, if you've done any kind of voluntary work, any commissions, internships, kind of artistic or creative industry based jobs, 
maybe you did something like that in work experience, do talk about this as well, because once again, it's showing that you're going above and, be above and beyond. Oh, I don't know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> I'm mixing up my words. It shows that you're going above and beyond and you are really embedding yourself in that creative world to learn a little bit more about it. Don't worry too much if you haven't got any experience in the creative industry or even if it's not kind of specific to the degree that you're working in. It is really good to show that you are kind of taking those additional steps to move forward with that work. And another thing that can be really, really helpful in terms of showing off what you know and that you are doing this additional research and extra bits and pieces is proof of visiting exhibitions. So this doesn't have to be your kind of standard sort of fine art exhibition. These can be things like trade shows, and it just shows that you are looking and going kind of extra far and beyond to make sure that, again, you are really embedded in that creative industry. And at the moment, obviously, this is a little bit tricky. And of course, lots of people do have uh, kind of travel concerns or financial concerns about visiting exhibitions. But if you can't do them in person, then I think the last year has shown us that there is a lot of stuff that you can do online that you might not have thought about before. And visiting exhibitions is one of those things. And it's a good practice to get used to visiting art galleries or areas where you might see work that is relevant to you because it shows you again that kind of research and development of current contemporary creatives that are working in your industry and you can generally see it much better than if it were in a book and a lot of online exhibitions now i know i've mentioned the internet here but a lot of online exhibitions now do take much more detailed photos so that you can get up close to the art and see it as well and it's good to tell people in your portfolio what you saw about that particular exhibition, perhaps include a page if you went to a gallery or a trade show or something relevant to your degree, include a page about that, include photos, sketches, anything that might kind of be relevant to that. And it's fine to not like something, but make sure that you can articulate why you don't like that in your portfolio as well. And generally, a lot of universities will want to see that this is something that you're doing and that you are looking up things that are relevant to your course or attending things that are relevant to your course. So do always keep that in mind. One thing that I know, I remember from university, I was marked on going to exhibitions. That was one thing that was a requirement for our course. So it's good to get into the habit of doing it a little bit early, just so that you can get a feel for it as a process, get a feel for what you should and shouldn't do in those situations as well. So this is one example that I wanted to bring up here. And this is one of my favorite photos that I've ever taken while I've been uh, teaching. And this was a uh, trip that we've gone on with a group of students to London on uh, a Saturday Club exhibition. And this is a Jenny Holzer artwork. It is an art installation that was to do with light. And you have these big beams going up the room and then you have text on them. And the person that is uh, in the middle of this page, who's at a bit of a strange 90 degree angle, was someone that I always fought with to not necessarily make kind of really realistic artwork and to consider other methods of making. She was just the kind of person that only ever really liked sort of very realistic pieces and she would just not get on with anything else. And she went into this room and saw this piece and was just absolutely fascinated by it. She absolutely loved everything about it. And had she not been to that gallery, had she not experienced that, she would never have known about that kind of artwork or that artist. And it really infused her to make new kinds of work, installation works, light works, that she would never have made before had she not seen this particular piece of work. So it's really, really useful to her to develop her own creative practice. And when you are going to galleries or when you are researching things online, there are a few things that you want to make a note of. And again, some of these might seem really obvious, but some of them might not. And this kind of thing is the artist's name, uh, the name of the work, dates it was made, the dimensions of the piece. So is it a massive painting? Is it a big maquette? Is it a uh, fashion show? Anything like that. The materials that were used to make the type of work that it is again so is it a graphic piece is it a painting is it a sculpture is it a kind of textile garment and any interesting facts about that and generally all these bits of information can be found on the little plaquette 
that are near the artwork. So even if you perhaps don't sit down and write down all that information when you're there, because sometimes it can be quite taxing and you might just want to be experiencing the artwork and not standing and doing a bunch of reading, but do just get your phone and take a photo of that little maquette and you can kind of get an idea of exactly what the piece is. And you can also find a lot about the context of it as well. So when you're making work, you're not just making that final piece, as we say, there's a lot of work behind it. But when you're in a gallery, you are only seeing that final outcome. So that little slack gives you a little bit of information about the development process as well. And it might give you things that you didn't know about it. It might tell you about their inspirations, what different things mean, any motifs in the work. So it's really helpful to look at those two. And then when you're putting that into a sketchbook or onto a portfolio page, there are a few things to think about that are important to include too. And they are things like, do you like or dislike it? Again, it's fine to look at a piece and think, actually, I really hate that, but I don't like it because of these reasons, because that can also progress your creative practice. So say you were a particular person that liked doing a lot of graphic design and you really liked bold neon lettering and you've gone to an exhibition and it's all about newspapers and you look at them and you think oh these aren't for me these are really boring there's no kind of exciting typography they're all black and white there's no good colors talk about why you prefer making the work in the way that you do and why you think that the work that they're making or the things that they're developing are less eye-catching less kind of engaging Again, talk about whether if it's similar to your work or not. If you find an artist that makes work that's really similar to yours, then talk about them or creatives again, because it will engage you and engage your practice. And do you know of any other work made by that particular artist? So one thing that I remember really vividly was going and seeing an exhibition and seeing a piece of work and really loving it and then realising it was by an artist called Damien Hurst, who you may or may not have heard of, but he does a lot of kind of taxidermy based artworks, shoving animals in formaldehyde and then popping them out on display. Not the greatest fan of those, but he did a series of pieces with butterflies and I had no idea about them and I really, really loved them. So look into the other work that artists have made because the chances are they've gone through a lot of periods of work and they're making things that look very, very different to what you're kind of traditionally thinking of. Then in terms of how old the work should be, you want to be including work from between the last sort of 12 to 16 months. Now that doesn't seem like an overly long time, but if you think of the work that you were making in kind of year nine or 10 versus the work that you're making now, it's probably very, very different. Again, artists and creatives do go through phases of work. They tend to have lots of different very, kinds very of styles that they develop over time. So including work that's relevant to the things you make now that is the highest quality it can be is always the best thing that you can do. And you can include older work, but only if it's relevant to the context of your more recent pieces. So say you're redeveloping an older project, then by all means do include some pieces of that older project. But generally the things that you're making now and things that you've made in the last sort of year are probably the most technically competent pieces that you have made and the things that you're going to want to be showing. So that moves us on to how you might want to order your portfolio. Now, this will vary massively dependent on the style of work that you make uh, and the way that you kind of generally think when you're making your work. You want to really choose what feels best for you. Again, as the creative, the portfolio is what is showing off your kind of lifeblood person is going to see of your years of work, years of dedication to that before you go on to your degree or even like I said into a particular job role. So you want to make sure that it is really presentable and nice to look at. If it's too busy, if it's really hard to work out anything, then it's probably not going to be great to give off the idea of the work that you're looking for. You want to make sure that it's really well organised as well, and it tells the story of your creative practice. There's no point in having kind of random bits shoved in willy-nilly. If you might have uh, dropped it in a puddle and it's all screwed up and there's water stains everywhere, that's not really showing that you care about your work. So you need to make sure that it is well put together. And again, you want to really tell your interviewer who exactly you are with your portfolio. And the order that you put it in really does 
tell them a lot about this in terms of how you might organize yourself, the way that you might make work and the way you might develop things. So even though you might not think that the thing you put first and the thing you put last is having that much impact, it probably is. And moving at the first at, at the end, you want to kind of put attention grabbing bits at the beginning and at the end, because psychologically, these are the most likely to be remembered. And of course, when you are talking to that interviewer for a really small amount of time, when there's lots of other people talking to them, even on the same day, and they're doing it for a long old time, make a strong impression. So a really good way of thinking about this is if you think of a film that you watched maybe kind of three or four months ago or a Netflix series you watched a little while ago, you can probably remember what happened at the start, the kind of introduction of that programme, that film, and you can probably remember what happened towards the end. So the middle, you might kind of get the order a bit messed up, you might forget something that happened. So those impactful pieces are good to put at the very beginning and the very end. And also you know where they are, so you can get to them easily in that case. Again, don't put everything that you've ever made in. We don't want to see all the artwork that you've ever made, and we're just not going to get a chance to have a look at it all. So do be selective when you're making those pieces. One way that you can do that, if you are, for example, making a physical portfolio, is by grabbing everything you think you want to put in and putting it out on the floor, just covering every surface you can in these pieces of work. And is there something that really stands out that doesn't suit? Okay. Put that in the no pile. Is there something that you're thinking, oh, this doesn't really go with anything else, I'm not too proud of this, I've done other work that's similar but a lot better, put that in the no pile. Again, similarly if you're doing a digital portfolio, open up as many things as you can on your computer, laptop, phone, or just dump it into one file and then just sit there and flick through it and make yes, no, and maybe folders because you can always rework it malleable thing and it will change over time. I have had the same portfolio since I was 15 and not one thing in there now is the same as when it was in there. So 10 years later every single thing has changed. Again to keep it relevant and to keep it malleable. Don't worry if you put something in and you think actually I want to take that out. That's fine. It's your portfolio. You make that decision. And having a sensibly well chosen selection shows that critical ability. So it's showing that thing we talked about earlier, where you can go, actually, this isn't that great. I'm not going to include it. And it's showing that you are able to really refine the pieces you're making and work on from them. So some ways that you might choose to order that portfolio. Firstly, it might be by artistic media. If got quite similar themes throughout all your work but you are making them in lots of different media so maybe you're making some painting sculptures you're doing an architecture maquette you're doing a kind of games design piece then you might want to order them by that media so having all the paintings in one section then all of your digital work in one section or your film work in one section so that it reads quite easily and we can understand exactly what you've done with all Alternatively, if you are someone who kind of is very ordered and likes the different things kind of exactly when you did them, then chronologically might be a method for you. So starting with your oldest pieces and then moving along as time goes on and finishing with your most recent work. It doesn't have to be finished. If you've got a piece or a project that isn't completely done, that's fine. We're not expecting you to have everything done. Pop it in there if you think it is going to be good for your portfolio. And this is something that you can do if you've had a lot of briefs and you want to kind of work through them in order. Again, similarly by brief. So if you wanted to include particular kind of directives that you've been given, you can put those in there in kind of sections from brief. And again, this is good if you are someone that does a lot of self-directed work because you can separate the work you've done uh, for exams, the work you've done for coursework, to the work that you've done by yourself at home. And of course, please, like I said, do include that if you're making your own work. If you've got any sketchbooks that you just sit and doodle in in the evening when you're bored, really do include those because they're useful for us to see. And again, with a colour palette, if you're someone that uses very similar kind of media throughout your work, very similar techniques, and perhaps you're doing lots of different kind of icons, then with a colour palette can look really interesting as well. 
So let's take a look at some examples of what I mean by some of these different orders that you might have. And again, just some more examples of portfolios so that you can see how pages might be laid out. So this one here, this is to do with an interior design and architecture portfolio. And as you can see, it has been organized by color. So we've got the gray at the top, moving down into this kind of teal, into green, and then into blue on the very bottom page. And this is quite a successful portfolio page selection because when you look at them all, you can see they're from the same portfolio. You can see that different projects might be being undertaken. We've got one here that almost looks kind of skate park inspired with this graffiti. And then at the top, we've got a kind of very brutalist style with these kind of hard edges, hard lines, lots of concrete. And then in the middle, we've got some different kind of more flowy sea and nature inspired sections. So we can see lots of development going on. And we can also see this consistency whereby this person has used the same structure for side of the page. So it's showing that it's been made by one person. They've got a clear visual style, but they've also done a lot of developmental work. So we've got some inspiration pictures right on the left side of the image here. We've then got some quick, simple sketches. And then we have some more kind of developed, rendered, colored in images as well that are giving us more of a feel for the exact thing that they're going to be making. We've also got some annotations here. The only critique I would have about this particular page is I'm not going to be able to read all this as an interviewer. I might be able to catch some things, but I'm just not going to be able to get all that information. So one thing you can do if you've got quite a lot of text on your portfolio pages or in a sketchbook page you might want to show off is just take a highlighter or a, a particular color of kind of paint or maybe a digital swatch and highlight some words or highlight a couple of sentences that you think are going to be really important. Because then while you're being interviewed, I as the interviewer can kind of pick up on those things that you're seeing is important. I can be listening to what you're saying, but I can also be taking a look at the pieces that you've highlighted and giving those a read to see what you're saying is really important to you. This one is a really lovely example of a photography portfolio. So this has been done in a concertina book, whereby they've put lots of different portfolio pieces on one side, lots of different photography, so I can look at and see it in a really nice and easily understandable, clean way. And they've taken some pages and put them over double spreads. They've doubled up on images on some pages. So again, it's a really visually interesting option. However, again, what I would recommend doing is adding a little bit of text to this, just so we can get some contextualization of what exactly you mean by all these images and why you've chosen them. Even maybe what editing software you've used, the different things that you've used to make them look like you have, even notes about what camera you took them with. And if you wanted to keep this kind of clean, easy aesthetic, then you can always put those on the back side. And that is one of the benefits of a concertina book like this. You can flip it over, have all the information on the back, and then have this really nice clean look on the front as well. And then here we've got an example of some game design. Now this is a kind of professionally made game. You might have heard of it, you might not have done, uh, but it's Journey. And this is a game and a page whereby we're showing here some really good developmental work. We've got those initial sketches of characters. We've got initial sketches of scenery and particular items that you might find in the game. We've also got then a slightly more advanced walk cycle that has been digitized so we can see where colors might fall. We can get a feel for that animation. We've got some more developed characters and set pieces as well. So again, we can really get a feel for that piece. And then we've got the title card of that game too. So not only are we just seeing that final piece like we've got at the top here, we're seeing the steps that were taken to get there. And this is what I mean by having a kind of 16 to 20 page portfolio. This can be on one page, but it shows a story of a whole project. And then you can pick out individual pieces and talk about those. So you don't just have to have one massive piece on one of your pages taking up everything. You can break it down like this. So you've got lots of things going on in one space, but it tells the story of a whole piece of artwork. Then moving on to the final section, and that is getting to know your portfolio. And this is to me, this is almost as important, if not as important as what's actually 
actually in your portfolio because if you're unsure it can really give off kind of bad vibes about you and your work so if you don't know about your portfolio if you don't kind of know where things are if you don't know what's in it it can really come across like you don't care and we're not expecting you to have the most amazing artwork in the world we want to get to see who you are as a person and that is going to give us a feel for what you're like and the kind of dedication you're going to have for your course. If you're nervous, that's a good thing because it shows you care about what you're doing. And in terms of getting to know your portfolio, some of the really important things for this are don't let anyone else choose that work for you. Your portfolio is really, really personal and it is malleable, like I said. So put things that you care about and that you want to show. That doesn't mean that you can't ask someone else's opinion, a parent, a friend, a tutor, a teacher, anything like that. You are more than welcome to ask them to help you. But in the end, that decision is yours. If they're suggesting something that you don't feel passionate about or you don't feel that you can talk about, if questioned on it, do not include it because it will not help you in that interview. You also want to know whereabouts everything is. Again, like I said, you're probably not going to get a chance to look at everything, even if you are whittling it down to that smaller amount. So know where your favorite pieces are and know roughly where things are, just in case you do want to flip to them. Or if a question's asked and you think, actually, that's gonna be really good for this piece of work, I want to show you this. Because you're not gonna have the most time in the world. So you don't want to waste time kind of flipping through a portfolio, trying to find something, not knowing where it is. You want to be able to just open it up quickly, maybe even adding tabs so you know where different sections are can be really helpful if you find that you can't remember where things are, just so that you can move forward and backward nice and easily without having any trouble finding anything in particular. And again, be confident in talking about your work. This is another really important thing. You want to know your influences, you want to know your development, your research, why you've made certain creative decisions. Just assume that you're going to be asked about it because you might not be, but it's always better to have an answer to a question than to get stuck going, oh, 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 I don't know what I'm doing, oh God, because that will again make it look like you've not kind of taken consideration. You don't want to just chuck random pieces in there because it looks like you haven't considered it and maybe you haven't even done that research so you've not done all that background you've just made something random and shoved it in and a really good way to get used to this is by going through your portfolio like i said with teachers friends family anyone you're comfortable with and talk about it with them it can be really awkward and it can be really hard to talk about your work but this is something you're going to have to do throughout your whole creative career. You'll have to do it in university when you're having assessments. You'll have to do it when you're in critiques, when groups of people are looking at your work. You're going to have to do it in the real kind of creative industry world when you're getting a job, because you're going to have to talk about why you've made decisions. Perhaps you've got a brief and your client doesn't like it. You're going to have to justify all the things you've done. So practice talking about each thing you're doing. Get people to ask you questions. Why have you chosen to paint this blue? Why have you chosen this particular angle on this architecture or this particular fabric? It's important to be able to really go in depth and talk about all those things. And like it says at the bottom, put things in that you're confident in talking about a lot. We want to be able to have a really good in-depth conversation with you. We don't want you just to go, oh, why have you painted that blue? Oh, because I like blue. That's, that's not helpful to us. We want you to, explain why you like that particular shade does it remind you of something is it influenced by a particular artist have you looked at the pathos blue period and it's similar to that think about all of those things when you're putting in work and really most of all show them you care when you're doing that it will really elevate your elevate our understanding of you and your work. so we want to show that you do care about it and like i said be nervous it's fine to be nervous if you're in an interview and you're really worried about it that's a really good thing because it's showing us that you care about what you're doing if you're really blasé it's going to come across like you're not that bothered about it so those nerves that you feel are a really really good thing and in terms of some last top tips we're nearly at the end of the presentation now i know we've really whizzed through that and there were lots there but we are just going to go over a few last bits and pieces that might be helpful for you 
One thing is that most universities will have portfolio guidance on their website, and normally this is tailored for specific courses as well. Some of them just have generic portfolio advice, and some of them will have advice that is really specific. And I wanted to show you an example of that from UCA. So uh, the university that we are representing from today has a section of their website. I'm just going to uh, share that with you. Let me grab my screen. They have a section of their website that is specifically dedicated to portfolio advice. And that's not just from UCA, that will be most places that you go to. So just have a Google. Don't be scared to just Google whatever institution that you're looking at, portfolio advice. And normally something will be there. So this one is tailored specifically for 2021. We've got a little video here that will just show you again some different bits and pieces that you might need. I am not going to show you that today because it generally goes over a lot of what we've covered, but know it is there if you need it. And then some universities like UCA will offer boot camps, so they will offer workshops and sessions for you where you can join them, you can ask interviewers, ask lecturers, show them the work you've done so that you can really develop what you're making. And then we've got different sections down here about how to submit, what should it contain, all of that kind of thing. And again, quite of institutions will have specific sections from their own website uh, and for their particular courses. So if you're doing an architecture course, you can look what you might want to include for that. If you're doing fine art, you can look what you might want to include for that. And if worse comes to worse, universities won't mind you emailing. If you're really stuck and you do want to ask a couple of bits and pieces, don't be afraid to find out where a contact section is and just say, hi, I'm a bit stuck with my portfolio you coming up and I just wanted to know if you had any information about portfolios for fashion degrees because generally someone will be there to help you. And then in terms of some other things you might want to include in a digital portfolio, I did just want to briefly show you mine as an example of what a website based portfolio might be. When I'm saying digital, that can of course be something like a PowerPoint, it can be a Behance, it can be a Flickr, whatever, it can even be an Instagram as long as you've got really good detailed sections on that but a website is also a really good option and this is what it would look like in a professional context with someone working as a professional artist and educator so in this section here I've got it broken down slightly so we've got specific things about education and artwork so if I'm looking to teach for you you can go to that section if you want me to make a commission artwork for you you can look in the artwork section so we'll just look at a quick example that we've got here. Hopefully my internet will be forgiving today and load quickly. So again, it's got a little bit of information, then it's got some images of work that I've made over a period of time so you can get a feel for the pieces. It also has when they were made, so you can see if that's the work I'm making now. Ooh, and it also has a little description of that as well. And again, for a similar kind of context when you're doing this professionally, of course you probably won't have this at the moment. If any of you have been in exhibitions, include that. But again, include different projects. So I've got here examples of exhibitions that I've been part of, performances, any curation that I've done. All of that kind of thing is going to be really useful for someone to see your work. So that about wraps up our session for this morning. I did just want to quickly hop back on over to that PowerPoint. So let me share that with you again. So like I said, those last top tips do have a Google of the places you're applying for. Generally, they won't be too specific because they know you're probably only going to be making one portfolio for all the different universities you're applying for. But there might just be some tips that you do want to weave in specific sections to just kind of highlight for specific universities. And if there is an artist you really like, a creative you really like, have a Google of them because they'll probably have a website and that will probably have a portfolio on it. So you can get some inspiration from the kind of work they make as well. And what I wanted to say, the last kind of point I wanted to make before we get on to some questions is get started as soon as you can. There's no early time to start. You want to start putting this together whenever you can so it's not stressful when you have to do that interview because the interviews might roll around sooner than you think they're going to and then it might be a bit of a worry because you've got a big thing to put together. 
So start making it now, even if you are in your kind of lower six or your first year of college, because it will really help you just be less nervous when those interviews do roll around. And like I say, if you are then doing an interview in a week, you look at your portfolio and you think, I don't want to include that anymore. Take it out. No one's going to worry about anything like that. So do start putting things together, having a play with it and get going. So I wanted to end that there and we can pass back on to uh, University Search, hopefully for some questions. Hi Georgia, thank you for that. That was really helpful and informative. So we're now going to start our live Q&A session. So please can you all just post any questions that you have in the chat, the YouTube chat or the Zoom chat and we'll get around to answering as many as we can. So the first question we have for you, Georgia, is can you bring new pieces of work to your interview if you've um, developed something after you've submitted your portfolio or should you only prepare to talk about work that you've submitted? Uh, that's absolutely fine. If you've got a interview, kind of either a Zoom interview or an in-person one, we want to see as much as you can. And if you are particularly passionate and you've got a lot to say about a piece of work that is new, by all means, bring that along. We're not just expecting to see specific stuff, especially because as a creative, you're probably constantly going to be making work. So if it's new, if you can talk about it, if you've got a bit of development, bit of research, by all means, please do bring that along. Thank you. So I noticed that Savannah's been answering quite a few questions that people have been asking about what they can do for their portfolio if they don't have a lot of experience in the medium that they're applying for. So could you guys just speak a bit about any advice that you'd give the students about whether or not they can submit pieces that don't directly relate to the course that they're applying for? So for example, can they use textiles pieces if they're applying for a graphic design course? Yeah, so I'll speak a bit on this and then I'll direct it to Savannah as well, because she'll probably be able to give you some good tips on this as well. But of course you can. University degrees tend to be quite specific. And of course, if you have chosen your A-levels or your college courses and you think, actually, this isn't for me, I want to do this creative thing as well. What you have is going to be useful for that. Any techniques you've learned, even if you might not kind of necessarily think it relates directly, will be useful for us to see, like I said, who you are as a creative practitioner. That is what we're looking for more than anything. And you're going to university to learn it. We're not expecting you to have all the knowledge on everything or have tried everything out when you start. That's what you're going there to learn and develop. So say you are doing perhaps an architecture course and you've study graphics and fine art at college or sixth form, include all those things, but maybe do some self-directed research into those topics. I'm sure if you are applying for a course in that, that you probably already have, but think about any of those self-directed things, any uh, creatives you've looked at, any artists you've looked at, and maybe include a page or two in your portfolio about some independent work you've done, just researching and kind of knowledging up on those specific courses. I think Savannah's probably got other things to say about that as well if I pass over to her. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I think you've covered it. I think the main thing is just to remember that um, almost every creative university, including UCA, kind of understands that not everyone has the same opportunities, um, doesn't have the same kind of A-level courses that are available. So absolutely do incorporate that. As I mentioned to one of the um, answers in the questions, if you're doing something like life drawing, but you're signing up for the graphic design degree, talk about how you kind of have learned that skill set of life drawing and how you would implement that into your work if you did a graphic design degree. Um, as Georgia mentioned, just finding those kind of extracurricular stuff to help boost it if you're not sure you kind of need that extra confidence. Um, and also remembering to kind of put your most favourite pieces at the beginning, at the end. I know George has talked about this. I always use Game of Thrones episodes as, a, as an example. So Game of Thrones, you always remember the beginning and the end of an episode. So like George mentioned, just making sure that you're kind of having that to support that there. But yeah. That's great, thank you. So if students are looking at creating an online portfolio, are there any specific applications or software that you'd recommend that students use to build their portfolios? Yeah, so you can really use sort of whatever you feel most comfortable with. There's no point in kind of really stressing yourself out trying to learn a new piece of software if you're not comfortable with it already. But one I would really, really recommend is a website called Canva, which is C-A-N-V-A.com. And that is, there's a free version and a paid version. Uh, the free version is awesome and has everything you could possibly want on there. 
but that is a kind of template website and it makes templates for portfolios, for mood boards, for Instagram pages, for videos, anything that you could possibly want. And it has lots of different options on there as well. So say you were doing kind of, again, a textile, you could search up kind of textile portfolio and it will give you lots of kind of set templates for it. Then you can really personalize it. You can change colors, text, drag stuff around, add different imagery, add your photos. And that is one, if you're perhaps not too confident in using different digital design softwares, if in Illustrator's maybe not your friend, anything like that, then Canva is one I would really, really recommend. And that is again, so it's C-A-N-V-A.com. That's a really good one. That's great, thank you. In your presentation, you mentioned that by looking at um, universities' websites, such as the University for the Creative Arts, you can find lots of information about building a portfolio. Is there anywhere that you would recommend that students can look to find examples of past portfolios that other students have used? So again, this is this is probably quite a kind of social media one, but Pinterest is really, really great for finding previous portfolios. Uh, you can search again, kind of what course that you are looking at doing, and it will just give you some flat page examples. I know that sometimes kind of finding a format can be really hard. So sometimes it can just be really helpful, like you say, to look at other portfolios and see what they might look like. And YouTube is another one. You can just take a look and Google and uh, kind of search again, kind of fine art portfolio and normally there will be bits and pieces that pop up which can just give you a bit of a visual as to what you might want to make so even just kind of googling plainly it will generally bring up options and it will bring up professional portfolios and student portfolios so you can see that actually they're really quite similar so what you're doing is going to be consistent throughout that whole period as well. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how important are annotations and is there a specific weight that's given to annotations versus the piece of art? So I think this one kind of varies dependent on what type of university you go to. So if you're looking at attending something like a Russell Group University that is putting a little bit more weight into that academic side, then I would recommend kind of including perhaps an essay that you've written or popping in some annotations, but really they are just for context. Because if we're seeing just a page of stuff, it might be a bit like, oh, what's going on here? And you might have to explain it a little bit more. Whereas if you've got a couple of sentences, maybe some notes on there about perhaps the media you've used, when you made it, some artists you've looked at, that's just going to give us a little bit more information without you necessarily having to talk about it. So like I said on one of those slides, we can be listening to you, we can hear what you're saying about that work, but we can also be scanning that page and seeing, oh, they've looked at this artist, blah, 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 blah. And oftentimes in a university interview, it will be more like a kind of casual conversation. They're not going to sit there and interrogate you about what you've done. They'll be asking things like, oh, have you heard of this artist? Because they'd probably be quite good for this. Or, oh, have you considered trying this method? So having those annotations there can really just help us get a feel for what you're understanding already. And like I say, that can be a buzzword. It can be a sentence. I wouldn't write paragraphs because they can be quite hard to digest and we won't be able to read them. But if you do have something there, just highlight things that you think are important. But we are, as you say, we are looking at the artwork and the creative work predominantly, but it can just help us give a bit of flavour if we need it. Just to um, add on to that as well, annotations, because I, when I did my portfolio um, for my degree, annotations are really useful for your prompts as well. So when you're doing an interview, if you're kind of, we know how scary an interview is, and although George mentioned obviously it's really informal, we know obviously it can be quite intimidating and it's just there for you to kind of help relax and go, oh, actually, there's an annotation that's a really good thing that I really want to talk about. So it's a good kind of thing to prompt you to remember what you want to talk about as well for that. You won't have that awkward blank of forgetting the answer <laughs> to <your> research name. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question is about applying through clearing or putting in a late application. So if you're applying through clearing or if you're putting in a late application, you won't have had as much time as other people may have had to put together quite a full portfolio. So would you be able to submit some work in your portfolio that isn't 100% finished and then speak to the interviewer about how you're going to develop your work? Or should you try to only put finished work in your portfolio? Again, this is one I will pass on to Savannah as well. Yeah. Be able to this. 
Um, I mean, firstly, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I would say definitely include unfinished pieces. Like I say, we're not expecting everything to be completely finished and polished and sparkly. It is good to have work in progress in there as well, because again, that is going to be the most up to date stuff that you have. So definitely do uh, show work that isn't necessarily 100% done. But as for clearing, I will let Savannah, Savannah talk about that one. Yeah, so during clearing, it's usually um, when we speak through you, um, depending on your grades and that kind of stuff, we look at everyone on an individual basis. So it'll really have to depend on what the situation is and kind of what your grades are. It might just be that an academic wants to speak to you a little bit more and look at some of your work. So if there are unfinished pieces, then please don't worry. Um, we do understand, obviously, it is clearing. It's a last minute application. Um, and we look at everyone on an individual basis. But if you are concerned, just get in touch with the university that you're kind of kind of considering or you have in the back of your mind or all the universities you're looking to apply to to kind of have your backup and they'll be able to explain a lot more about kind of what options are out there for you. Thank you. And um, so our next question is about whether or not students can make multiple portfolios if they're applying for lots of different courses, or if you'd recommend that students just focus all their efforts into creating one portfolio that they send to all of the universities. So my recommendation for that one would be to put your effort into one portfolio. They do take a long time and they are quite taxing to make. So having lots of different ones is not really going to benefit you because you will be spreading yourself really thin, whereas you could be really focusing on one particular thing. What I would recommend if that were the case, so uh, I, I had a similar thing. I was applying to some courses that were kind of slightly different, so not all of them were fine art based. What I did is made sure to kind of clearly label my portfolio so that I had sections that I could go to. So if I was uh, doing a particularly kind of fine art heavy interview, I could go to the section that was more fine art focused. Whereas if I was doing uh, an interview that was more kind of graphic design leaning, I could go to that section. And like we said, we kind of want to see everything that you've done. It doesn't matter if it's not specifically relevant because at university, you will be trying lots of different things. So it is good to see that you've got kind of different skill sets. And as I say, it, it takes a long, long time to make a portfolio. So I wouldn't recommend doing doing multiple because you'll be it will be never ending. <laughs> yeah, I think my advice really is kind of if you're I mean, if you're looking at lots of different areas of degrees because you're kind of like, oh, I like all of that. And if it's quite a broad range from like, you know, animation, graphics, fine art, then maybe consider doing a foundation year first because you kind of cover all those areas and your, your foundation portfolio is kind of quite, quite broad on what you can incorporate. Um, there's a lot of information about the foundation years that you can do. and It's a really good way to kind of to get those tastes before committing to a degree. What you don't want to do is obviously, as George mentioned, it's, it's quite a lot to make those portfolios and those portfolios do need to be course specific depending on what you're applying to. Um, so it's less work for you looking at a foundation and also it means that you get to try all those different areas before committing to that degree. Um, so it kind of is a nice little booster to help make that decision before you kind of commit to making that decision and thinking, oh, maybe I wish I'd done another degree instead of doing this one. That's great, thank you. So our next question is about interviews. So do the University for the Creative Arts have group interviews or are all of the interviews that you run individual? I'll take this one, Georgia. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so all of the interviews are individual. We don't do group interviews. However, the foundation is kind of Previously, before the pandemic, the foundation was kind of you went into a room, you got to meet people um, and then it was an individual interview. It really depends on the course as well as to how it will work. So just get in touch with your university to find out more. Obviously, during the pandemic, we are not kind of doing on campus interviews or anything. And currently, we're not actually doing any kind of formal interviews other than, you know, specifically for UCA, our business school. Um, but get in touch with the university to kind of find out because each university is slightly different as to how they kind of do their interviews and how the interviews run. Normally as well, if you have been given an interview, it will tell you the format that that interview is going to be on whatever it is that's saying you've got an interview, whether that's your kind of letter, your email. So it can be good just to take a look at that and note it down because then it can make it feel a little bit less intimidating when you're kind of turning up and you've got an idea of what's going to happen rather than just turning up and going, oh, okay, there's a load of people here, what am I doing? 
Thank you. Um, our next few questions are about interviews again. So roughly what time of year do interviews tend to take place? And does the University for the Creative Arts offer any additional support for people who might need extra help or English help in their interviews? Yeah, absolutely. Really good question. So of it, um, absolutely, we do offer support. If there's any support you need, just let us know and we're more than happy to um, offer any support that you may need. In terms of when interviews run, it's usually after the UCAS deadline. Um, so when you submit the UCAS deadline, obviously in the normal world, it's the 15th of January. This year, obviously, it moves to the 29th of January because of the pandemic, but we're not doing physical interviews. So let's say in a non-COVID world, you would have the 15th of January deadline for UCAS um, equal consideration deadline. And then after that, you would then have the um, an uh, email sent to you saying you've been invited to a applicant day which would be you bringing your portfolio and having your interview um, but yeah absolutely for support we provide as much support as you need it's just getting in touch with us and letting us know. Thank you um, so I think this will be our last question for today and it's do you have any general advice that you would give any students who are thinking about talking about their portfolio in interviews just any advice or interview tips that you wish that you knew before your interviews and that you just recommend that people research beforehand? My, mine would probably be again I know I've talked about this a bit before but we're expecting you to be nervous I know I was really stressed about what I should wear and how early I needed to be and if I was late and how I came across and all of those things seem really really important at the time and is really stressful and worrying but things like wear whatever you're comfortable in wear something that shows off your personality we're not expecting you to be in a business suit or a kind of fancy outfit whatever you feel comfortable in is absolutely fine it's not like a job interview we're not expecting anything like that and yeah be, being nervous is is a good thing because it shows us that you care and you will be probably nervous you will be probably scared it's unlike anything that you've done before i imagine but that is not anything to be worried about and oftentimes it can be helpful to mention that if you are worried at the start of an interview and you're really really nervous just say to the person that's interviewing you oh I'm a bit worried about this and they'll be able to kind of calm you down de-stress you out because we're expecting that to be the case so that's that's my kind of main thing I think what about Savannah? Yeah I completely agree I mean I I studied at UCA myself I did the foundation and my degree I understand how nervous it is um, please don't worry. Our academics have done this hundreds of times. They know how nerve wracking it be. Our academics are absolutely lovely. And that goes for all universities. All university academics are so lovely and they just want to get to know you a little bit more. And it's just an informal chat to kind of have a chat, get to meet you, kind of know your passions and why you'd be interested in the course. Um, usually in a normal world there are students around the campus to have a chat to as well before and after um, so please please don't worry everyone understands UCA understands that you know it is, a, it is a terrifying moment and as Georgia mentioned kind of being ner nervous a little bit is actually quite nice because it knows that you care about being part of the university you're applying to um, but if you like, like George said if you are nervous just let us know if you do need that support just let us know um, but yeah everyone quite a nice thing about being at a creative institution no matter where you go is that everyone is a kind of a creative community we're all there for the same interests so um we all kind of have that like-minded creative mindset and understand that you know this is an amazing thing to take part of so everyone's quite understanding in that aspect they're there to support you as well that's the other thing they're there to kind of help you we want you to join us you're kind of coming to us as much as we're advertising to you to join our institution so if you do have any kind of specific worries if you have any kind of physical illnesses or if you have something like anxiety and panic attacks do let us know that before you attend the interview because then we can support you with that we will be able to kind of help you out with that during that interview process so if there is anything that you're particularly worried about that is going to affect it do let people know even if it's just a quick email because we'll be able to kind of make adaptations to you there as well that was great. Thank you guys so much for joining us this afternoon. If you've missed any of the webinar or if you want to rewatch it, keep your eyes out for the post webinar email with a link to the recorded session. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye.